Sonic Talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 582, recording today live on Wednesday, the 3rd of July. Gosh, it's the 4th of July tomorrow for you, all you Americans, Independence Day and whatnot. Uh, so, yes, and I hear you're having a large military parade, which should be quite exciting if that's not something you've seen before. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a podcast dedicated to uh, music technology, to things to do with music production, software, uh, controllerism, live production, and anything that kind of and the surrounding the culture and the technology that's involved in music making, creating electronic music and Otherwise, uh, I want to say hello and welcome to all our friends in the chat rooms. We've got uh, presenting new oops, trans- That's not it. We've got people in the IRC, or we would have if I'd actually pressed that properly. It looks like I've got to just fix that issue. Um, uh, we'll say hello to the people in the chat room and in the IRC. I'm just going to get the IRC up. Uh, I've had one of those weeks this week. It's been an absolute nightmare of stuff not working properly. All that kind of rubbish. So, yeah, there we go. Friends of the IRC, which is working. Uh, apologies to our Facebook friends, but Facebook is not accepting a live stream today. So I'll upload it after I've done this. So uh, sorry if you're, if you're wondering what had happened there. Um, so, yeah, this week, well, Glastonbury's over. It was a sunny one. There was no rain. Um, and, um, well, I don't know what else is going I'll ask our guest, because we have uh, uh, the lonesome Dominic Hawker, who we haven't had for ages. You've, you've been offline for a bit, haven't you? Or you've been busy and ill I have. and all sorts of stuff. I have. No, thank you so much for having me back. I was I was ill last week. I really wanted to do that. But, yeah, just um, timings have just been a little bit weird, really, finishing off a few bits and pieces. But it does feel like ages. It's probably been about five or six weeks. And I love coming on this thing you get so many nice little compliments and so many uh people kind of talking about it and, and not so much compliments as well but it's just so good to be to be here talking about this kind of stuff but it's uh it's you and me i think just today so uh hopefully we can fill an hour with some absolutely devastatingly interesting stuff to talk about <laughs> that is a bold claim uh mr dominic <laughs> uh, and i i'm not i'm i'm not going to be supporting you in that uh in in that yet but we'll, we'll, we'll assess that at the end and see how it went um, so what's been happening this week? Well, I guess the big news is uh, Massive X is out, and I did do a, I did a, a hello video. and welcome this to is Sonic very Lab. Weird, uh, we're very lucky today. The same in the shot. Fact that we've had a bit of a look at the uh, new Massive X from Native Instruments, uh, which as as has been just recently announced in the last day or so. So uh, Massive X is uh, all new, mm. looks like this. It's quite different from the original Massive. If I just uh, close this down and open the original, you can see there's a... I won't play that. That is. I, I'm so glad I'm not wearing the same T-shirt. That would have been even more confusing. <laughs> um, but yes, so we got to have a look at it. Um, we only had a beta, so there are a couple of things that were different. Uh, but uh, So it's out, and it's been waiting an awfully long time. And I'm, I must admit, when I got it, um, I was... Uh, it'll work fine and everything. I, but the, uh, um, I think there were some issues with uh, the interface that I found, and there's different presets. One thing I'm very surprised about with Massive X because it's a huge—I mean, it's a hugely deep synthesizer with lots of rooted potential, but very little graphical feedback. There's no kind of uh, trigger lights on the envelopes. There's no actual envelope displays where you've got these diagrams of the envelope, but you haven't actually got, they don't move when you dial the knobs. There's no rate indicators on the LFOs. Things like that, I think, kind of make it a little harder to disentangle. It's okay if you're starting from scratch, people going, oh, just use your ears. And yes, you are, of course, right. But if you find a patch you like, go, I wonder what's going on here. <laughs> You'd be hard pressed to find out in some cases. Um, Massive X, of course, I mean, a real as sort of one of the one one of the, probably the most famous soft synths of all time. Really, I mean, it's spawned an entire generation of wubbers, I suppose. Uh, are you a, are you a massive X user, Dominic? I mean, it did. Sa- I mean, it, massive sounds very good. I mean, it does sound good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got Massive X um, behind me. I got it. I didn't get a beta version. Um, not important enough for that. But I did get it pretty much as soon as it came out. Um, I used Massive. I'm not. I'm not a massive user of Massive. I used to use it quite a lot. It's ended up in my list of synths. I think, to be honest, my go-to's are still uh, Serum, Omnisphere, um, Falcon. I like. You know, the, the the pretty much the odd standards that people use. I'm quite into the Roland Cloud at the moment as well. So, having a refreshed, new, um, lovely kind of Massive X is really interesting. My, I saw your 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 um, your review of it as well, and I, and I agree. I think it's just been rushed out. I, I hope it's just been rushed out. I don't think there's 
I didn't think there was massive amounts of presets there. And then I checked the original massive and that didn't have a massive amount of presets either. So I'm guessing they're going to sell some add-ons or whatever, but I did expect a lot more sonically within it that could give me an idea of what it can do. It's clearly a great sounding thing um, and the depth to which some of the oscillators run and the things you can do with it are outstanding. I don't think the presets there in it that really show that off. No, and exactly what you not. say, some of, the, some of the feedback, the tactile stuff, you know, I want to see the shape of the envelope. I want to see the shape of the LFO, particularly now with some of the alternative synths that are coming out, soft synths anyway, that really make, it, make yeah, well, the most pigments, of it. So, pigments really, exactly. really threw down a new gauntlet in GUI design, didn't they? Yeah, really, that yeah, really. yeah, which, which clearly came out 90% of the way after they'd started developing Massive X, so they've got a lot to live up to. But my my gut feeling is it took a lot longer than it sh should have done to develop, and they've had to put something out. And I'm hoping version 2 will probably fulfill all of the stuff that people have been saying. I did see a really interesting YouTube uh, analysis, which is way too geeky, actually, but just looking at the sine wave and the aliasing that's coming back on the sine wave. And actually, if you if you do look at a straight sine wave coming out of the oscillator, it does alias. Um, now, I don't really care about that because in my ears, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, but it's not pure, clean sine wave. And it's like there's something slightly strange going on internally in the way that the filters are working well, isn't and stuff it, like that. Isn't so it a wavetable? It is wavetable though, isn't it? So it's a wavetable based thing, yeah. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I sorry, absolutely. It's a, it's a sample playback of some kind. So there's going to be some sort of interpolation going on. I think, yeah, I think the sign as it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really weird to look at sine I mean, wave, straight sine wave like coming out of one probably oscillator. manage manage to generate a sine wave. Yeah, without yeah, yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll dig out the video and I'll, I'll oh, yeah, post send, it in Facebook through. underneath this one because I saw it and I thought, now you're doing something wrong. And then I tried it myself. And I'm like, this is weird. This is, you know, this is not a true sine wave coming out of a box that has a picture of a sine wave in it. Anyway, that, that is not really a criticism. That's just something that's just a bit strange. Um, but yeah, it feel, feels unfinished to me. And I was actually a little bit disappointed when I unwrapped it, plugged it in and started playing with it. I've got, I've got to be honest. It feels a bit 2000s, doesn't it, in terms of UI? Um, and, and and even to the point where, you know, you, you're, I mean, and I understand why you might do this, but essentially, you know, you drag the points like you do on the original Massive and you can dial in the amount. But on the original Massive, you get these indicators of what the signal is doing, whereas these are just fixed. There's no indication. The only thing that changes, mm. yeah, there are 16 macros, which is all cool. And you can, you drag those. And then when you turn a macro, the macro knob will, t the, the, the knobs that it's pointed at will also turn. So you do get some kind of visual feedback there, but that's probably the least useful useful of all the visual feedback yes. really uh, which is is a bit disappointing one of the really big things is um there's obviously this issue with uh, requires avx compatible processors which uh if you haven't got one of those which i think is post pre-2011 uh, or post-2011 as intel and uh, compatible which allows and what does it do it, it's it's a set of instructions uh for doing let me see it's doing single it's Service for single instruction, multiple data operations on a new extension coding scene has been designed to make future additions easier as well as making coding instructions smaller and faster to execute. But if you haven't got one of those, which is pre-2011, you're out of luck uh, and it won't run and it won't even tell you it can install. And there obviously, as ever, there's a few disgruntled people saying, well, it didn't say that when you're at the are you sure you want to pay for this point and uh so they could it seems like they could have handled that perhaps a bit better but it again it it it, it sort of shows there's might have been a bit of a rush going on to get this out yeah 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 that that said sonically i think it will probably sound amazing it, what i've got out of it sounds brilliant and i haven't even you know scratched the surface what's in it um it's the instant gratification. I've bought something new and I really want to go, wow, that's just missing at the moment. Um, and I'm I'm really hoping things like the display coming back, the feedback is the kind of thing that they can bring in in a future release. They've kind of had to stick a, a stake in the sand and say, right, here we are. This is it. This is Massive X. We, you know, we're letting everyone else get ahead of the game here. And and the the internals and some of the presets actually as well, not, not, not all of them, but are, are show of mighty things, I think. It's just that they don't seem to have had enough time to actually really make the most of those. So when we can get some decent people making some decent sounds with it, I think we'll be really, really happy with with sonically what it can do compared to the the serums and that kind of stuff that's out now. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that that's true because they kind of got leapfrogged a little bit by Serum, didn't they, in the wavetable stakes? And everybody's doing wavetables. Right. And, and there's been some, uh, like we say, there's been some uh, leaps and bounds in gear. Um, one thing about the oscillators that's really interesting, there's like, I think there's 170 wavetables uh, on board. And there's also a load of different algorithms for scanning that how those wavetables are scanned, and that's really interesting, and you and pre-filtering. Mm. I mean, it's really powerful. So it's a sort of sound designer's dream, perhaps not so much of somebody a casual preset flipper. Particularly, it comes. I think it comes with about three hundred presets, which isn't an awful lot. And again, in my version, I wasn't able to uh, have the complete control integration, which obviously you get now. But when I was when I was talking about it, I didn't have that. It hadn't been, you know. It, baked in yet or, or released yet so i couldn't i couldn't demonstrate so it was actually quite an unpleasant experience mousing all the presets and whatnot so you know all of those things made it feel at that point a little bit clunky but i think that some of those things are going to be addressed it just feels like it needs to be really really good and if they went early because they felt pressured because they said they were going to do it in june and they said they were going to do it in i think well was it september or, or january i can't remember and they haven't then something's gone awry somewhere and perhaps they should have uh, they, they they should have the resources to be able to get that right you think but I, who knows what yeah i agree i agree all, all of those Classic all of the issues that we're talking it? about <laughs> quite all, all of the issues that we're talking about would not be issues if they still called it beta um so you know um, I, 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 we, I don't think we should be negative because i think under the hood is a phenomenal machine yeah um, it's just, yeah, you know, no one's got the right set of keys yet to kind of fire it up and, 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 and make it go. So yeah, I'm just a little disappointed. Even, even a few more presets and I'm not really a big preset fan, but you want that instant gratification that, that, that would do. But yeah, as you, as you start delving under the bonnet, looking at the, the, the possibilities there are outstanding. And I, I, I actually do like the interface that they've got on there, aside from the fact that you really can't see what you're doing and i know that sounds really stupid the 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 drop downs and the way that you can change stuff works really nicely um the, the feedback side of things um obviously needs a little bit to be desired but that stuff can definitely be fixed in software it's yeah uh, it's gooey yeah. stuff isn't it i mean it looks very yeah. much like i mean as we've seen with uh, native instruments a lot of their new products seem to be uh, almost prototyped and built in Reactor and then compiled into standalone things. And mm. it, it's got a sort mm. of blocks vibe and a Reactor vibe together with it. But obviously, it's not just that. I mean, there must be a lot more uh, other. But yeah, it's a sound designer's dream. And there are a lot of uh, really evolving and ethereal and paddy sort of stuff. Some really interesting sounds in there, which perhaps not what you think, because massive, you tend to think of huge, thick, heavy waveforms with masses of bottom end i mean it still does that it's just got other stuff as well i think I, I didn't really get a chance to check the cpu i should probably do that but again with a with a well it wasn't really a bit with a pre-release you never can be too sure but uh, i i was kind of floundering my way around a little bit that because i'm not a huge soft synth user you know and something that complex yeah. is quite challenging yes absolutely i mean I, I do use a lot of them i think you said in the review this is this is not massive too this is really is a new massive and I don't know where the massive goes away now. I mean, the, no, the, the way they've right, so they are they are different beasts, um, and massive is still very very you know valuable in today. It's not like uh, um, it's it, it should ever go away. And you're right in, in that it's it's invented or it's been used to invent completely new genres of music. Um, but yeah, this I mean this this excites me. This has the um, the, the capabilities of being one of those go to synths, like the serums, like the omnispheres. Um, that of, of and like the divas actually originally um, yeah. that's that's a really good analog one um, you know that that sort of are the core things that everybody uses and everything else is not quite up to that level They're like the the fab filters of the synth world I suppose yeah I suspect they'd better get on the, their skates on and release uh, a GUI update pretty sharpish though because if you leave it too long. People are going to be wondering what's going on there, I suppose. Um, okay, right, let's see what what's next. Uh, what's the time? Oh, well, uh, yeah, let's actually, let's do uh, uh, a thing from uh, our friends over at Isotope, because we can. Why not? Presenting Neutron 3, the modern way to mix. Bring your workflow into the 21st century with eight modern mixing tools, all at your fingertips in one Mothership plugin. Starting a mix can take a while, but with the all-new Mix Assistant, Neutron can listen to your audio and quickly suggest a custom starting point for an individual track or set levels for your entire mix. 
Shape sounds like never before with the new Sculptor module. Match audio to a target sonic profile and instantly sculpt it to sound more like itself or like something else completely. Reach out and touch your audio with Neutron's immersive controls and visualizations. Neutron 3 comes equipped with Visual Mixer, a tool to help you effortlessly manipulate the landscape of your mix. Neutron 3, the modern way to mix. And of course, you could download a 10-day fully functional demo as usual from isotope.com. Uh, and do offer that, do suggest you check that out. I'm going to use that. Touch your audio. That reach out and touch your audio. That's a good tagline. Uh, we have a competition um, this week. Uh, in fact, we've got the winner from last week. Which let's get do that out of the way first. A guy called Joe Joseph Scott at Joseph Scott Mix Assistant Neutral Three Sonic State Inc. Uh, and Isotope Inc. Yep. Short and sweet, no extra characters in there, just, you know, but that's what the supercomputer <laughs> random machine picker uh, is from Cheshire in the UK, bizarrely, so not for, not too far away from us. And we got another, uh, we're looking for another winner uh, for this week, and we're looking for, this is Neutron 3 Advanced, I should point out, which is actually a bit more of a super, super duper as well. Uh, so we're looking for the hashtag channel strip and the hashtag Neutron 3 so at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. on Twitter. So the hashtag channel strip and the hashtag Neutron3 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. I think I've, I used channel strip because uh, there was somebody, one of the quotes of uh, the people who, who were talking about Neutron3 said it's the channel strip of the future, which I thought was quite a good line as well, but it's a bit too long for a hashtag. So it just gets to be channel strip. We, we thank Isotope for providing the prize for this week. Very much appreciated. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think I've got this. Have I got something? Hello. Oh, no. Hello. That's not it at all. What am I looking for? <laughs> Hello. No, I'm, hold on a minute. I'm looking for... Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. Where are they? Uh, I thought I had... This was the um, Focusrite oh, gen yes. third generation. Sorry, I thought I had that lined up. I've, I've been reviewing the, uh, the 18i20, and I thought I put the video in, but I'm probably not such a good idea. Yeah, uh, I... Uh, Focusrite uh, revamps the Scarlet range. Uh, we've had a 2i2 here for ages, and it's it, it, you see it everywhere. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Yoad uses a 2i2 or some such thing. Lots of people use them. The, the mic preamps in them are supposed to be really good. And the third generation increased. They've also added it to the, uh, it's now USB-C, uh, which means, I guess, it's a standardized cable and will mean you've just got a single plug. And I've been reviewing the uh, the 18i20. Uh, sounds really good, actually. The dynamic range and the noise floor have been increased by another factor over the third generation. The tw the, they've also got alt monitoring. It's got this air um, circuitry on all the mic preamps, uh, which you can, on the 18i20, uh, you can only switch it in software. But it's this sort of tilty cue that lifts 4 dB between 100 and 10K. So it's, it's supposed to... Uh, emulate the kind of sound of the Focusrite ISA mic preamps, which, as we know, lots of people, lots of producers use those as part of their vocal channels. I don't know, have you got any Scarlet stuff? Have you tried the Focusrites? I mean, it's it's, it's starting to no, have I did into premium territory, yes? Yeah, 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 which is great. There was a Focusrite desk in London, wasn't there, years ago? This massive, huge, proper desk that I worked on years ago. But uh, no, I, I'm, I'm in your hands on this one. I hear very, very good reports, and I know loads of people use them. I've got, I'm lucky enough to have a Burl, Burl mothership in here, which is like a really high end um, A to D and D to A converter. And that has little um, uh, transformers inside, which you can sort of overdrive it a little bit. And I have a couple of these pre Sonos boxes uh, there, which are just sort of handy um, to use for things like this. That's where my, my, my audio is coming in. Um, and I've always looked at those at those other boxes to think well i think because i think they run well with ipads and stuff as well so yeah but, but in terms of actual can, yeah. yeah in terms of physical usage no i haven't i'm looking for something that would work well with the with an ipad as well and uh so maybe this is the time to bite the bullet and actually get hold of one I, of those yeah things. i don't but know the, i mean obviously the thing with ipads is the power consumption isn't it and i think you probably yeah. have to have a lower channel count uh because driving that many mic pre's and 48 volts is probably going to be beyond just the regular thing. So you need a mm -hmm. USB... -C. Is there such a thing as a USB-C hub? I don't know if there is. There I think you can feed power into it in some ways. I'm sure I've seen someone being able to compensate for the lack of... For the lack yeah, of power no, going. no, because I've got a USB-C thing, dongle thing here, which is... Uh, I feed the power into it and then it goes on, but it's just a port replicator. So 
Right. It doesn't, it's not right. a USB C to multiple USB Cs with power. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So I, I'll gotcha. split them. Gotcha. I'm not quite sure how that gotcha. would work. That might work. Although, um, no, there must be because I, my new phone, I'd just like to pl plug that. This is my. Uh, this is a Xiaomi. Um, it's an Android one. I was going to get another Samsung, but uh, it's only got a USB C and it hasn't got a headphone so socket. And I was thinking, oh god, uh, am I going to survive on that? But the price, it was like two hundred and seventy quid for a hundred and twenty-eight gig, six core, you know, six gigabytes of uh, operational RAM. It's pretty decent, and that's brand new. Uh, but it's got a USB C, and I bought a USB C splitter to a headphone thing, which has then also got another USB C in. So there must be. You know, lots of USB C devices have a through uh, for power, so I suppose that would work. But uh, it sounds great. Yeah, but we digressed. What, yeah, we do digress. I oh. don't know why. I, I just had to get that in there. I felt like I had no, no, no. I don't. Not with your phone. I meant with the uh, <laughs> with the, with the iPad thing. It's no big deal if it doesn't work with an iPad. No, your phone is uh, is, is is amazing, and I'm I'm sure it would work with it as well. But uh, no, I mean moving away from the iPad side of things. Uh, you alluded to it. I mean, the quality of these things now is astonishing. So working out of a hotel room with a microphone or whatever, it's just brilliant. This bar thing I've got, it gets amazing reviews. It does sound brilliant. You can overdrive it. It's sort of an analogy sounding thing. It's an absolute fortune. And, um, you know, a, a carry around USB driven one of those, or even some of the alternatives that are around now with the with the mic pre's that they've got are just astonishing. And what you can do now, just literally with your with your laptop, one of those and a mic is 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 stunning, absolutely yeah. stunning. Yeah, they sound. I mean, there's all sorts of routing and stuff. The only, one thing I will say though is I don't know if I mentioned this live on the show yet, but I had a I've got a USB C cable which I bought, uh, which just came for it's like a uh, an SSD, so I use it for data. And I thought, oh, that'll be fine. And I plugged it in, and it wasn't fine at all. It it actually the, the sync and the clocking, the communications between the laptop and the unit. This is obviously wearing on a Mac was was terrible. Um, so I had to swap it out for that. It does come, the unit does come with a, a USB-C to regular USB. So you can always go via a hub. But I swapped it out for the one that comes with the MacBook Pro from the from the power supply to, you know, the thick white one. And then it was all fine. I, I didn't realize that USB-C cables could be so different from each other and um, so poor quality. So I'm going to have to look into getting some other ones. But that's a, that's a, that was a real gotcha. I was tearing my hair out yesterday. What, that, what left of it I've got. The data rate that's streaming down that stuff now, I'm, I'm amazed anything works really, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're really, really high frequencies shooting down that thing. So not just the quality of the cable, but the way you lay it sometimes, if you're gonna lay it across a, one of those little clag nut power supplies or something, that can also affect it as well, just simply because there's so much RF and, and static floating around. So you're right, I keep, keep it as short as possible and, and buy proper ones, don't, uh, Stay away from the, the the cheap eBay imports. I think for all that kind of stuff, because you'll yeah. you'll forget, and you'll just be sitting there going, "Why does this sound so rubbish?" And the last thing you'll think about is the cable. Yeah, that's true. I've had it once or twice with uh, regular USB cables, where an audio interface just wasn't performing quite right, and you get, I guess, you get more jitter because the, but uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it is the last time you think, and and you know. It, we, of, we often say, certainly in the world of audio, that, you know, spending, you know, thousands of pounds on special high silver content or, you know, <laughs> hand mined copper or whatever it is, is, is kind of crazy. And, it, and it, I would agree in the audio world, but perhaps not in data world, <laughs> it would seem. Well, yeah, it's, it used to be the opposite, isn't it? It's ones and noughts. What could go possibly wrong with that? Well, actually, yeah, they can, they can end up in the wrong order in a, in a spike or a bit of static can can change them so it is true you know there's a there's a balance isn't there there's obviously super cheap cables that are absolutely rubbish and and you know have a couple of tiny strands and there's stuff that's just good like use a mains cable to wire your speakers up and then there's stuff that's just ridiculously bonkers that you can spend absolute fortunes on and i'm sure any audio files in the chat room will probably explain to me why they cost a fortune but um yeah the middle ground is usually good enough but i can't stress enough actually the way you route them um, if you keep your audio cables away from your mains cables, away from your power supplies, that kind of stuff, you don't have to, you know, just chuck them over the other side of the room a bit, keep them apart. That really will make a difference to the odd little click and buzz and static. It's not going to make your audio sound perceptively better uh, yeah, as a general stop, rule. Stop the it'll, interference. It'll stop the, the, cl the crackles and the clicks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, keep yeah you know, wise, wise words, I think. Um, I, I guess, um, so I don't think the full Gen 3 range is there. I don't think there's a 6i6. There's a Solo, Solo Studio, 2i2, 2i2 Studio, 4i4, 8i6, 18i8, and the 18i20. And it ranges from 99 quid up to 449. So they're not 
cheap. I don't know whether that 449 seems reasonable for, so you get uh, eight analog inputs with air on each of those. You get uh, a pair of ADAT inputs, but you can only use eight as inputs uh, unless you, you use the second one if you're in SMUX mode and you're going up uh, to 96K. Uh, and you've got 10 outputs and monitor control and a RC, an SP diff. This is on the 89 20. My review will be out shortly i was gonna i was hoping to film it finish it yesterday but uh i only got the final drivers literally as i was about to start finishing up the review um so you know it's always best to have those um yeah uh let's have a look ah oh no this is good uh, this is good news this is uh just a bit of lovely uh imogen heap action here this is uh from imogen heap this is a tiny desk concert from npr radio uh, imogen has been doing a uh it's a world tour. This is from America, Washington, D.C. With Guy Sigsworth, who's bizarrely not playing the piano, is playing the keyboard. This, we'll this is the first song they've written together for 17 years since Fruit Fruit Split. The album Details was one of my favourites, I would say. I can't believe it's that old. And find our feet. I'll probably get bo um, hit by the uh, copyright police if I play too much of that. But yeah, Imogen Heap's back on tour. She's uh, she's just done the US leg. I think there's going to be some U uh, some European and UK dates later in the year. But more importantly, back with Guy Sigsworth. And I think Fru Fru Details is one of the seminal albums of the 1990s. It's It's got that kind of songwriting now that she's got together with her really unusual take on technology and arrangements with guy sigsworth's magic genius and guitar playing it's a really brilliant thing so i'm i'm quite excited by this in fact i don't know if i can announce here we've got we're talking to imogen's people and she is maybe coming to do a sonic talk special with us uh in a couple of weeks so i'm really hoping that all works out obviously she's a very busy woman and uh, and whatnot um, i don't know you big are you a fan of imogen heat i mean she's really quite a a, a touchstone in terms of technological kind of a innovation. Yeah, do you know what? Ways. I've never, um, I've just turned the top down on my voice in case it sounds a bit dull. Someone was saying it needs a DS on it. Um, I've never been a massive, not, not just a fan, but never really been a massive follower, which sounds terrible. It was always a cool really. guys in the bands that I was with that, uh, that would, would, would quote her or whatever. So I was listening. It sounds amazing. It sounds absolutely amazing, but it's not really been an artist that I've followed, but I've been aware of, but no, I don't think I've ever even heard that album, which is. That's a great yeah, album. It's embarrassing it, 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 really. So, but I would, I would say if you, cause it's very, uh, it, it was a really brilliantly produced record for its time as well. And it has really accessible songs. Some of her other stuff is, is a bit more whimsical, um, and, and more mm. artistic. Whereas this is more, it's like a sort of route one pop album but with with a bit something a bit deeper so it's good and obviously got hide and seek and those other tracks that she's famous for mm, as well but mm, mm. yeah uh, um no i mean this is this is now a nice new discovery for me i'm obviously aware of the name and, and aware of, of her and what she looks like and stuff but not of the uh, not, none of the output at all so so over to you really Okay, well, I'll try and fill the dead air with that. Uh, <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, so I'm just anyway, going to go off and have a quick listen yeah, to the yeah, album while you, you right. talk about uh, it. <laughs> well, um, apart from uh, Imogen Heap was also the, the Mimi, Mimi, you, Mimu gloves, which is uh, something she's been working on for years. And I think I, I did have actually have a look at uh, the Mimu gloves, which you can now pre-order. They're supposed to be coming, literally... It says, hold on, let's, where does it say? There's something up here. Mimu Gloves pre-order now. Uh, limited pairs available. Delivery August 2019. At the end of that video, actually, she does uh, explain, do a talk through it, and then performs hide and seek using them. And it's very, it's really interesting the way that she's, it's visceral. You know, and the reason that she's done it is not to be cutting edge necessarily, but because she didn't want to be, all the rest of the time she has to do that stuff, she has to stand in front of a keyboard or a synthesizer and be tied to that. Whereas this, she could be gestural, she could be moving, and it's it it, it, it makes sense when she, when you see her use them. Um, because generally, you know, most people when we see them being used, it's generally more of an experimental nature and perhaps you don't connect initially to the art they're making, whereas Imogen's stuff is more accessible. But and she sp spends a lot of time talking about the technology that she's using in her concerts and stuff. So it's, I'm really looking forward to talking to her. I've always wanted to, and I'm hoping that we can. And we got through that because uh, Tim Exile, who uh, is a longtime collaborator and friend of Imogen Heaps, uh, we did some stuff to help launch the um, oh, what's it called the Endless F Endless dot FM. And we just said, oh, any chance you could ask Imogen if she'd come on? And and it, it's got, it looks like we might get it. I mean, obviously. Fingers crossed. But yeah, this is good news as far as I'm concerned. But I, 
I, t- I tell you, Dominic, uh, you need to check out Fru Fru details. That's the that's absolutely, the, it's a, it's absolutely. A, it's a I, um, I saw she was a backer on the endless stuff, which is great. Actually, really, uh, really like the endless app, and uh, I thought that's a strange. Uh, strange kind of connection and now that makes a makes a lot more sense um yeah brilliant i will uh, i will go and cover myself i know the chat room's going wild with people saying how amazing she is and the great use of technology and everything so it's clearly me that's out of uh out of well i tell you what i tell you what the other thing i because i was looking on her site today just kind of you know poking around looking at blog, blog entries and she's there's lots of really contemporary artists like big like uh, taylor swift uh, on her album uh, 1989 taylor swift came to london and co-wrote a track with Imogen Heap and you know she's she's written a blog article about this and how what a fantastic experience and and Ariana Grande you know she did a cover of one of her tunes wow. on looping and turned up for a cup of tea and you know so she's she's Brilliant. seen as this real I mean it's great it's fantastic that she's seen by a lot of these emerging artists you know big I mean Taylor awesome. Swift you get an album you get a record on uh, on Taylor Swift's album and it's like yeah thank you very much even if it's only a yeah, tiny yeah. co-write that's like yeah that's me a retirement fund probably well, isn't it? right said Fred just got one as well for uh whatever that Taylor Swift song is it sounded like I'm too sexy they got a co-write for that so uh, yeah they're not doing too badly either Ouch! Now well, that'll pay for some holidays. Look, and plenty, look what you made plenty. me do. That's right. Yeah, it, yeah. it goes. Look what you made me do, and it's exactly like I'm too sexy. And they actually gave him writing credits on it. So, uh, oh, fair yeah, play. Amazing. That's good. Amazing. Yeah, I wonder if anyone will sample any of my demos. That's what I need. I need one of those <laughs> <laughs> just to sort need... of tide me over. <laughs> I need a massive, massive American band to do a, a cover of "Stay Another Day" because it was never a hit in the US. So, ah, okay. Like absolutely huge american band do a christmas version of that then uh, or what you, yeah, what you, be... you need you need your publisher to basically start lobbying the i mean because there must be the equivalents of the us the uh, marks and spencers you know the big ads mm. there must be a coke america a christmas coke ad or a christmas macy's ad whatever those yes. are you need you need someone on the case to get that in yes. there right yes a whole team of people my to be fair I think I've done all right out of it, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, well, that's know. fine. It's, like <laughs> it's the first world problem, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah, we're all yeah. good. We're all good. Um, anyway, so, yeah, Fru Fru, I'm not sure if Fru Fru are back. It wasn't clear whether they were going to be working on new material or whether they were just touring. So I'm not sure what exactly the end result of them both together. But, uh, I mean, they, they only made one album together, and I don't know whether they fell out or whether they just sort of, you know, parted in the just because of the end of the project or whatever they didn't tour that so now they're touring and i guess they might be doing a couple of frou frou songs live if that's what you want to see but i thought that was cool anyway i i i'm i just any chart any opportunity to talk about and to fingers crossed imogen heap i'm trying yeah, to yeah, I, i've got awesome. a, i've got a the only problem i'm worried about now is not having intelligent enough questions and coming across like an idiot that's the that's mm, the, always the nervous that. thing when you when you've got to interview somebody sort of of <laughs> Of that <laughs> magnitude that you're just going to just really do a bad job and they're just going to treat you uh, with contempt. But I'm hoping I I, she seems like a nice down. person. Even if I do come across as an idiot, I think she'd be kind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you could come across as an idiot, really. Oh, I, I suppose, I yeah, I it's when you get you. the real, <laughs> if you get the super, super nerdy, geeky fan questions, that can be sometimes slightly strange. But I tell you what seems to work sometimes, and this comes back from when I was involved in the film launches, is just to ask a couple of questions which are not the obvious one. Like, you, you know this anyway, right? But a tiny little bit of research about something so obscure that they suddenly go, wow. Oh, you remember that? That was three years ago, and it was only appeared in the tiny little thing, you know, because everyone yeah. just does the Wikipedia, you know, and how's it going? And 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 what did you think after that last album when the press said it wasn't as good as the first and all that kind of rubbish, rather than you know what did you what did your dad say when you decided to be a musician? That kind of stuff is much more interesting. I'm going to use that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mate, uh, I'll, so I could give the impression that I am I'm, I'm just below stalker. But, but, you know, research, <laughs> research. So it's just yes. that kind <laughs> Yes, yes. Anyway, yeah, not well, the, uh, well, what exactly is your address? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's all good news. Um, right, so, oh, yeah, here's another one. So we'll, this was, uh, I think I've got this here. Um, this is uh, Get Carter has been on Cherry, Cherry Red Records. Uh, basically, the Get Carter original soundtrack, uh, which is by... Roy Budd. I thought it was. I, I thought it was, I've been saying it's by Harold Budd for years. But uh, I've got the. Uh, I mean, if you're not familiar with this, this is the sound of Get Carter. I mean, it is this. This is the seminal track. You'll probably recognise this place. The heart's calling. 
I know Gaz's band um, cover this. Wow, this is heavily compressed. I wonder if this is tape or whether this is this is the YouTube. Anyway, I'm not going to play the whole thing. I, I keep saying that, but I'm not because I definitely will get busted. But this is the the new album, and box set is out on, uh, like I say, Cherry Red. But it's it's not sort of strictly massive news. But uh, Roy Bird. Um, some really interesting facts about this album. This album was done on a real shoestring because uh, at the time, Get Carter was considered to be quite an experimental film and it wasn't all that big a hit, but it's actually become this sort of timeless classic. A lot of the music in there now is seen as sort of really uh, quite powerful and they recorded it on a budget of 450 quid with no overdubs. It's brilliant to save time and money and he, he simultaneously played a real harpsichord, a Wurlitzer and a grand piano and he said, uh, dis he but described the experience as uncomfortable but it sounded pleasant. <laughs> but so it's it's one of those projects that obviously was a rush job. It just all came together, and it you know may not have been much fun. We've talked about this in the past, haven't we? Where you you, you the the process you think very uh, not fondly, or when you're doing it, you think this is horrible, and then with the hind, with the power of hindsight and you know a bit of distance, you go actually there was some good work in that. But uh, yeah, a I don't know what you think about Roy Bird and that track. I mean, it is it's a classic. It's seven, some of those seventies soundtracks really just. It's it's so uh, evocative, isn't it? You, you, you're just instantly there. I love that kind of stuff. It's almost sort of James Bondy spy style stuff. And you're right. I think I think the act of having to finish something really changes, really changes everything, doesn't it? Because you don't really know whether it's very good in your head, but you actually have to hand that tape over and it's done. Um, and it's uh, my my business partner, my ex business partner, was involved in publishing. He used to publish. Um, for Dennis Publishing Maximum in the US. And I came from sort of doing an IT style stuff and he came in from a publishing background and he could not understand the, the, the idea that deadlines could move because when you're in publishing, your magazine has to come out on the 30th of it's the month. Hit the or trucks, whenever, isn't it? Yeah. Every single month, you know, the presses are running. That's it. You, you can't move it. It's done. And the idea of us developing a... Uh, an app or some software or whatever it might be. And I just, but you know, it's going to be a bit late, you know, like, this is unheard of. And the same thing is with, with music. If I'm sitting in here trying to write a song, I guarantee I'll take as long as I've got and probably come out with absolutely nothing. Whereas if you're saying, well, you know, you've got a song to deliver tomorrow, you've got a track to deliver tomorrow, whatever. Um, it may not be brilliant, but it's going to be a damn sight better than the one that you took six days over because it just sort of, you just go around in circles. And I think that's part of, of that appeal of the, of the whole thing i would i would just say i did a um one of the things i was doing whilst i haven't been on on here was uh, i wrote some music for uh, a short student film for a cousin um which i promised to do as part of the um the final part of their degree it's two half an hour episodes actually they did an amazing job it's the first ever film stuff i've done i thought it'd be great i'll get it and stick it on a show reel and you never know. And I only had four days to do it in, which was absolutely brilliant because it would have taken me months and I wouldn't have been happy with it. So concentrated into four days. Um, and I, I went back and I looked at the interview you did with Ty uh, in Bath when he was playing all his stuff. And I looked up all the synths that he had and I you know, put it all together. I bought some Spitfire audio strings and all that kind of stuff. Boy, is it hard work. He makes it look really really easy um but it came out okay it's not brilliant at all but again the fact that that deadline was there meant that you know i'm not still sitting here trying to finish it off you know i've got my life back and i think it's it's better for that but again a little bit of a digression i mean you, you go back to those sounds in that film and other films of that one i was thinking of was um uh, uh simon and garfunkel uh, sound of silence what is it mrs robinson um, yeah what's it called? The, graduate. the graduate the graduate yeah first time I heard Simon and Garfunkel was, was just at the beginning of The Graduate, which was immediately evocative of that kind of summary. I think it was late 60s when it came out, 67, um, and all that stuff. It's so evocative. And there aren't so many films these days around now because they kind of pull from the latest hits or the latest artists that suddenly you hear it and you go, yeah, that's that's that film. That's that feeling. Maybe Qu Quentin Tarantino, Tar Tar Tarantino's stuff would be a bit like that. Um, 
Well, because it's music that's already been in existence. You're right, actually, because now the films, uh, films and music and artists, that symbolism is used to launch, to, to create a bigger sum of just the PR for the song or just the PR for the film. Whereas back then it was yeah. part of the score, more so. I mean, not saying fully, but I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, that, that uh, Roy Budd soundtrack, it sounds very 60s, although it's into the 70s, because you go forward four or five years and we're talking uh, Assault on Precinct 13, you know, which is a very, yes. very different. Whereas, you know, you've got the Dirty yeah. Harry, the Layla Schiffer and all that, you know, all of that stuff is sort of inhabits the same world where there's a very experimental mm. uh, instrumentation was used to to create. So the orchestration was what created, like, uh, you know, the, the fact that this sort mm. of the double bass and a jazz trio with a harpsichord is kind of like, wow, that's weird. Yeah. And, and now you think nothing of it because we've had Portishead, we've had all of these other things. Whereas then mm, it absolutely. was like, wow, what a different, a different sort of show. It's like, it's like a different department, wasn't it? I think, I think I read or I heard Across 110th Street, the Bobby Womack song, that the film is called Across 110th Street. And I think he, he didn't have, he had an album and they didn't want anything on it. He said, I'll record another song. And you know, he did that in a day or two. And that's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant song. And then you're thinking back again, I was thinking back in the eighties, you've got, you've got films like Pretty in Pink, which did use the artists of the time, yeah. but they've ended up with that legacy of, you hear those songs and you think of Pretty in Pink, you know, they just captured a moment in the eighties with the psychedelic what was the name of that? Psychedelic Furs, that's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and a whole bunch of other 80s artists there, which sort of tip and Breakfast Club and that whole era of of that kind of thing, which which they did they did take modern artists and, and artists at the time and they just packaged it in the perfect way. Um, it's interesting. Just, I mean, going, to... just going back to that kind of concept of working on something and you know maybe it's a tight deadline and you don't have time do you think there's a there's an element of when you're creating stuff you know we have the luxury specifically now when we can endlessly cycle whereas you know before we would have to rewind the tape or rehearse with the band or whatever we can we can have we can sort of immerse ourselves you know to, to just below the air passage in the music so that we we feel much more of an ownership and, a, and a, an immersive sort of feeling of it. So we know we sort of know it better before it goes out the door. I mean, this is assuming we don't have a deadline and we're just kind of endlessly tinkering. But you you get this sense where where you know when you don't, it, it's like you're you're just the conduit for stuff that has to come out in time. So you afterwards you can listen to it again and go, oh, actually that because it doesn't sound like you because you didn't. You didn't hear it as many times as you would normally do. I wonder if there's an element of, of that going on. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. I mean, there is a massive, for me anyway, if I'm if I finish something, sort of done a demo or done a song or whatever, the moment you play it to someone else, it sounds completely different. Whether that's your girlfriend or your mother or your dad, one step on from that is play it to the A and R guy or play it to the label. It sounds completely different, and suddenly you're almost thinking you're spotting things that you were never even thinking about before. It puts you in a different frame of mind. Yeah, that's. And that's I also, weird. you know, and, and that could be anyone, and it is really important to get someone in because you suddenly, oh god, you know that? I thought that chorus was good, but actually, you know, it doesn't work there. Um, and also, I think these days people are expected to do everything and you can do everything you can do everything on a laptop if you want from from recording the first note to mastering the final audio to, to uploading it to district kid and, and and getting it on on spotify or whatever but and that's been a natural progression but people forget sometimes that like elton john never wrote any words he worked with someone who was really good at Bernie mm. talking at writing words so just prior to that i guess it would come together but they just came together no one works with lyric writers that much anymore you know um and i'm not suggesting it's necessary but but take it way back and you look at the franks and archers and all those guys those guys were great singers mm. and they had to do a take in one take with an orchestra all mic'd up press go on record and that record would come out and the reason they got signed is because they could do that they sounded great and they yeah we, we i talked to jamie Lidder, i talked with jamie liddell about that a little bit about the kind of notion it's an interesting i just want to bring a couple of things into the chat room uh we have uh, some great quotes here uh rodney linderman said the best music is made with a small budget and a tight deadline that's brian eno and jim harris says great leonard bernstein quote all you need for greatness is a plan and not enough not quite enough time to do it which i think that's, <laughs> that's, that's all that is really good isn't it that is that's a great yeah, totally that, totally totally, really totally that works nice quote. that works yeah yeah, I mean, just um, then spin it, spin it up to the other end, and you're basically, you know, in here. I can make whatever you want, and it can sound brilliant. But that doesn't mean to say I can write great lyrics. It doesn't mean to say I can program great drums. I'd like to say I'm a really good keyboard player because that's all I've ever done 
in my life and i can probably compete with some of the some of the best of those but certainly can't you know not even the best producer compared to the producers i am but i'm kind of doing everything um and i think sometimes it suffers because of that also the whole i mean we could go on for hours about this whole thing the whole method of distribution that the judge the, in order to get what you are producing out there in front of the right people is now more about playlists on spotify and tidal than it is about labels and a and r guys and i think that's probably a good thing but um you know you're, you're one step back from someone listening to it and developing you you're kind of producing the final thing and someone's saying yeah i quite like that um, yeah, I might listen to the next one or yeah, not into that. You're not going through that development stage, which became less and less and less until now there is no development stage whatsoever. You just need to get out and do it. And that needs a lot of ego, a lot of ability to overcome criticism. And yeah. you just need to get out there. Um, and actually, to be fair, every single successful artist had that from the beginning. They just had a little bit more help on the way up in general and, and a little bit more guidance generally to take them to a level where they got there quicker. Nowadays, you just got to blast through it um, and, and get to the other end. And, and because of that, neatly coming back around again, don't spend three months making one song spend spend three months making 30 songs and, and pick the best one because you'll you'll end up with a better song and a better career out of it well no i think that's true i mean i think that development process is an interesting way you put it because because of the accessibility of music technology and just music making and, and, and people having a go there's rather than have one person focus on somebody else you just sit there and wait for the good stuff to float to the top and go yeah that one's going to work that'll work in a film you don't actually get necessary it's harder to find but it also it, it's self-leveling to a degree, so the good mm -hmm. stuff just somehow bubbles up because there is, you know, without having to spend much of the record company or the publishing company's uh, money on it. I mean, I, I am generalising. I'm sure people in both industries will say, "What the hell are you talking about? It still costs a fortune. It's it's a nightmare." Blah 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 blah. But there's just more of it. It's harder to find, whereas perhaps yeah. before yeah. there was there were there was still plenty, but there wasn't as much. And I think there's a there's this sort of sense of aspirational aspirationally. There's that there are two things. I was listening to I think there's a there's a app called TikTok which is getting a load of flack at the moment because it's yeah. it's like a social currency app where kids uh, basically spend money to get mentioned by influencers. And I just thought that really reminds me of when I was a kid and I really wanted to be in a band and I'd play a gig <laughs> and I'd think, oh, somebody I know might be there or somebody from, you know, another venue might, or somebody from a record company will show up and they'll hear us and they'll and we'll have this thing happen. Where So it's exactly yeah. the same thing. It's just like I might go viral. I might, you know, one of my Instagram posts might just be liked by somebody famous and suddenly I'll be somebody. It's really, it, it's similar, but there's, it's just a much broader thing. It's not necessarily just to do with music. It's it is, stuff. and it's. I, I, I think it's the right thing. I mean, way way back um, when I was writing singles and stuff, if you weren't on the Woolworths playlist, you would not chart. Woolworths would book in like five to ten singles a week. If you weren't on that list of the stuff, and Woolworths is a shop that's no longer with us. Um, you know, they had that much influence as a shop. You simply wouldn't chart. So most of your pluggers at, at one stage would be going out to Woolworths to make sure your, 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 your track was in, was in the shop, let alone ready to go into the charts. So, so the kind of gatekeeping that used to go on and the, the label that would say, well, you're going to have to stock our record and, and we need it charted. Otherwise, we won't give you the release of the one that you actually want of the other band that we've got that's really successful. But that's all kind of wrong. It all, it all happened that way. But... Um, you know, and you get these ridiculous situations when the dance boom kicked off, where, where the labels would pay the artists, pay to record the thing, pay to press the labels, give the give the records away to the DJs, and then actually buy them back themselves to chart them half the time and, and boost them in the charts, which is clearly a non a business that just doesn't stand up. So now it's brilliant because the doors are open. Anyone can be a musician. Anyone can make music. Anyone can do that, and that's fabulous. But what the flip side which no one kind of realized was that means there's an awful lot of music around and the filters that say well actually Dominic I know you like XYZ band therefore you'll probably like this are now algorithmic and generally playlist based and I don't you know the, the influence over playlists that Spotify and Tidal have 
hasn't yet even been seen to be as important as it actually is. If you get onto a Spotify playlist, which happens to be a Friday Friday evening wind down playlist on there, that could probably make your career. And I don't think many people that's are kind of no. I, 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 I guess I, that's really weird, isn't it? Because I mean, it's such a chance thing, and the fact that it's it. It, it's AI effectively. They're, I mean, although mm. some don't, some of them have curated things. I mean, there was a whole thing about yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them are curated by actual humans, but maybe the thing is now what will end up is you know that there'll be algorithm. You know, oh yeah, yeah what you want to get on the title, the title algorithm is really suited to your music. You know that kind <laughs> of stuff, which is sort of yeah, you know, that's yeah. kind of that, that's going to start happening, I guess. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, exciting. It's going to be embraced. There's, there's artists I know particularly from back in the in the 80s era when I was more sort of active playing with them who just think it's terrible you know and 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 actually it people had it in my opinion is people had it way too good back then we made far too much money out of music that you know um, other people were working much harder getting paid a lot of money to have a, a play on radio one 40 quid at one stage you used to get for a, a play on radio I mean that's outrageous so now it's sort of settled down a bit it's valued at a level where you know if you go out and play and you sell tickets and people want to hear you you'll make a decent living and that seems to me like a little bit more of a level playing ah, the, 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 I'm sure the history of the, the history of the pluggers <laughs> i remember when um when we when we were doing our thing uh we had a management and label um that was sort of a bit of diy uh, and it was a friend of ours called Henry uh or henry he was a kind of uh, he was like a south london gangster type character I italian italian cockney and uh, we had meetings with, you know, to, if we want our tracks to get played on Radio 1, this was back when plugging and, and payola was still a bit of a thing. To get onto Radio 1, the producer let it, let it be known that he, would, he, he really needed a new lawnmower. And uh, this was related back to me, and I was just sort of like, what? So we got to buy this guy a lawnmower to get our track possibly put on a playlist i, I mean i just thought what the <laughs> hell and that really shot i mean and, you know it was way worse in the states and that the payola scandal broke much earlier but it was still going on in the bbc and in in those worlds whereas now i think all of the charts now um, certainly the, the the bbc's charts and the, and the kind of commercial music charts radio charts are following the digital download chart trends which are, yes, are presumably completely. they're not they're not impossible to fix presumably but they are probably less so you can't go out and buy you know i suppose yeah. you could get a load of people to buy digital versions of your single on amazon which probably contributes to it so i suppose it's it, it still do, it probably still happens i mean you know let's not yeah. be around the bush yeah. it probably does yeah. but it's it's more expensive and would be crazy to invest that sort of money whereas getting uh, your your track playlisted on national radio or stocked in Woolworths or played as background music. This was a good one. If you would get you, you could get your music played as background music in one of the three big soaps on the UK television. That was also a really good yeah. thing to coincide with the single. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've had that. I've, I've had that actually with a couple of tracks. It does. Um, it is okay. But uh, no, I, I think, honestly, I think it's a good thing. I, th I think, you know, anyone, I, I hate anything that has gatekeeping involved. You know, you have to have a deal in order to chart. You know, you, you you just make your music, get it out there. Just don't give up if someone says I don't like it. Um, the the ways of actually generating a career out of it at the moment tend to be more about going out and doing gigs than than selling yeah, down. It's like not superstardom, but you could you could you could kind of get by. Absolutely, right? people carve yeah, people carve out great, and and that's true for older bands as well as artists that are coming out today. You know, they've, they've there is a direct market to your fans that you know you just have to open and keep banging away at it and that is actually no different to what it used to be like it was no easier back then to get in front of labels and get signed and get stuff stuff out there now you can actually get on and do it and you've got the tools well pre but, and presumably there are less people who are going to cock it up for you you know because what, yeah. what re you know you there, there are so many stories i mean you, if you've read the uh, thomas dolby thing you know, there's so many instances where he's made the album loves the album the band are touring there is ready and then something happened that was completely mm. out of his control through some bad administration for his record label or whoever and it just gets tanked and those are the sort of things that happen but it's more likely now you know you could have all of this great energy that would be you know youtube mm. following and all of these gigs happening and then you know something terrible happens uh, you make a terrible faux pas on social media but that's much less likely to affect your career unless you're really really big so yeah it's interesting yeah absolutely absolutely two 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 things that still stand up today that that made a massive difference for me is, is work with other people 
you know, even if it's just getting to come in and listen, but get someone else, write, write stuff together, bounce off each other, just see what happens. If it doesn't work, stop working with them. And the second thing is don't go knocking on labels doors so much or whatever, or even management stores, to be honest. Go find the best music business lawyer that you know and just go in and get into them and see them and say, look, I've got no money. I'm just starting out with this amazing music. Um, I need to be introduced to managers and to labels or whatever. Will you work for me for two months for nothing or whatever? Or give me a contract where I pay you back or whatever. Because the music business lawyers know everyone. They absolutely know everyone and they represent a lot of them. And if you've got the balls to go in and get them to work for you for nothing, even if it's for a month or two, that means they respect you and they will say, do you know what? This guy came in. I quite like his, 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 um, his MP3 I've got here. I quite like this track. What do you think? And he'll get it in front of the right people. That's how I, that's how I got my stuff into labels originally by going to see a lawyer, not for advice, but for his contacts. And it was oh, just, just a, 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 it's, an it's open a, door. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Well, uh, we seem to have made it to five o'clock, Dame, uh, Dominic, without having to uh, resort to too many topics. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just uh, show you two exciting oh, things? Oh, yeah, please do, please. That you didn't, we didn't got to the, what have you been getting up to? Oh, yeah. I borrowed, okay. one, of, borrowed one of these. Oh, from Tempest. A fabulous friend called Jennifer, and, and it's amazing. Absolutely brilliant. I've always wanted one. And then when uh, I kind of read all sorts of things about the Tempest, when they said, you know, their software isn't particularly reliable and it doesn't work half the time and the upgrades haven't been promised, um, it's brilliant. It's like I've got a TR8S, and you put them side by side, and the TR8S sounds great. You know, it does 909 sounds and brilliant but then you kind of switch the Tempest on and it sounds like a funky Prince. It's just amazing, really good. And then the other thing that I got, which is bonkers, is one of Sherman. these. Sherman. Ah. So I managed to track one of these down, which is yeah. called a Sherman filter bank. And if I can fit it in the whole screen, there you go. Yep. Um, and it's basically two killer, filters killer filter and two. a massive distortion and compression unit yeah. yeah and it's got midi on the back and you can trigger stuff and all the rest of it and most of the demos you'll see have a, have a, a youtube for, for sherman filter bank that makes the most amazingly awesome chaotic noises which is what most of the demos are but what it also does is if you use it kind of gently it does sound amazing as well so these are two things unfortunately i have to give the tempest back um, but the Sherman is mine, so I'm trying to make the, the most. The of thing it about the Sherman is, it was. Well, I remember when it because I've got a. I did have a Sherman. I think it might be with Goldfrap actually. The Sherman Filter Bank too, and we used it. All of the sounds, uh, Black Cherry, the album, those really distorted drums and some of the real. That's all Sherman Filter Bank. I I used it everywhere, and it is because you almost get that kind of bit crushy. It just kind of it's it can, mm. you know it doesn't have to filter. It could do all these other amazing things. And yeah, and it also is great for writing articles because you could always say fancy a Sherman, you know, say it's, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to leave that there so people can look up Cockney rhyming slang. I'm not going to explain it. But, uh, very good. Very, but, very um, good. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that. And yeah, I agree with you, Tempest. I remember when I reviewed it when it first came out, it had, I because it's a six voice synth, isn't it? So you can create some mm. really f interesting and, and mm. very hands on sounds. But yeah, there was stuff like at the time, it didn't have sixes or it didn't have some sort of swing quantize. You know, there were things yeah, missing, it's... you know, you couldn't do. You know, but no, I'm sure that's changed now. But it's still it is a bit it's, of a classic. It's complicated. Yeah, it's not the easiest thing. I mean, I know my way around it. It's not the easiest thing in the world. It has its limitations. But I do. I think it's a bit of a future classic. I think it, it, it's a six voice synth, and a couple of extra oscillators on there have samples. A lot of samples. You can't change them or whatever. But it just has this sexy kind of warmth to it and it does yeah. sound like a prince track and and prince obviously used the lynn drum roger lynn helped design this one so it's no i think there may be a sort of psychological link in my own head between the two but it just grooves and you just put them side by side with something which is kind of nice clean hard 909 or sounds or whatever there's something earthy and really really nice but i was super impressed because I, I swapped um I lent them my OB6 because I wasn't playing much with that and uh, um, swapped it for that for a couple of months. And and I, I don't really don't want to give it back. I think it's just a, it's an awesome beast. Really, really, well, you really can still good. get them, although I'm, I'm not sure if they're discontinued, but you still get. Yeah, um, well, it's got that compression circuit in, isn't it? The analog compressor that you could just dial yes. in. It just gets. Yes, which is get, exactly. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's sort of on and off. That's one of the little things. Is there isn't a, a gradual. You move it a tiny bit and it's on and then it just gets bigger you know that's more one of on. its quirks but <laughs> exactly more on and exactly 
Steady. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't think, I, yeah, I'm just thinking of show titles. I don't think I could do Fancy or Sherman. I could, maybe I could. I'm going to put that down as a possibility. But uh, uh, Fancy or Sherman, yeah, that's... That was it, yeah. And, and uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. There were such lovely people, the people who make uh, the, the Sherman, uh, Mika and uh, Herman, Herman Gillis. Oh. Really, really right. nice people. They, they were the two people that I first met, I think, when we were doing Music Mesa, who I kind of fell in love with a little bit. You know, she was just, mm. she is, mm. I mean, she's still around. She, she's absolutely lovely and really just sort of mm. very, really nice. And, and Herman's the same guy. He's just, he looks like he's knackered and works too hard. But, I mean, he, he, he's done some amazing <laughs> things. Um, but, yeah, I, no, I he, did, he did some other filters and EQs and stuff for DJs as well, from what I remember. I, I was, I was, I was well, in, well impressed because you can just kind of put anything through it. And it doesn't have to be this completely over-the-top blasting machine, although it does that very well. Um, yeah, very, very tactile. And, you, and with MIDI on the back, you can do all sorts of crazy triggers and stuff. So another I, I kind of um, just getting interested in stuff that sounds different now. I know there's a lot of monosynths coming out. There's a lot of stuff that it sounds good, but they – it is sounding a little bit the samey and the Tempest and the Sherman both just seem to be a little bit unique, which is. Yeah. Uh, well, kind of the Sherman, the Sherman for a long time in the, in the, I guess it would have been the mid nineties. It was the producer's secret weapon because it was, uh, so you'd get uh, Steve Osborne and all the kind of big uh, dance music producers and pop producers would, would say, yeah, you've got to get one of those. It's got a sort of mm. thing. To, it was like mm. MS 20 Sherman Fil filter bank, very much the same sort of world occupied, you know, and that, those were, I mean, really kind of classy pieces of equipment and, and just sounds great, you know, really uh, I, I, I messed it up a lot. Okay, well, um, well um, I've caught up. you have. Cool. Well, no, not only that, but, uh, you know, now it's it's like cordroids, you know, they're sort of back in I'm fashion. Back again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, you know what I mean. Uh, okay, um, thank you so much, Dominic. It's been great fun having a chat. I mean, uh, as we know, you know, some, summer is a... Uh, is it always a fun set of months? Less news, less people around, so we can have more of these kind of one-on-one -on -one things. And I was very much appreciated. Um, oh, your app, by the way, did you get to? Uh, is it out yet? Are you plugging it? Is it if it that... it's finished, and um, actually, that is a good point. It's finished. It's not in the store. They've got it. I just have to press the button. There's a few people who asked to test it who are miss. I missed off the list. So tweet me at Dom Hawken, just on the screen, if you didn't get an invite to test it. I mean, it, it is finished. It's basically ready as soon as I say launch it. Um, but I would like you to get early copies because you were so kind to ask in the first place. And I think I've missed a few of you off. So by all means, tweet me again, and I'll send you the uh, the, the coupon to get it for free. And the idea at the moment is to uh, switch it on in the App Store on Monday. Oh, right. So really? Cool. Imminent then? Sit back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Proper. It's all release candidate, ready to go, everyone. It works as well. People are actually falling asleep on it. So, yeah, quite how, Yeah, that's quite lucky. Tr that's tricky. So it works. And then how do they know, you know, so how, in like in reviews and stuff, what uh, what happens <laughs> with that? Because you just we're kind just, of make these assumptions. Yeah, I think it just works. Just peters out about halfway through. Well, yeah. well, that was for me when I started. I thought, well, yeah, I'm going to spend like probably the best part of 18 months now doing something wouldn't it be terrible if i switched it on and it kept everyone awake and and actually no we've got kids falling asleep to the sound the most bizarre sounds there's there's a cat purring in there that works for someone there is a school playground that makes my daughter's auntie margaret fall asleep it's just bizarre some of the things that work but it does so how work. did you discover so how did you discover good. well okay now uh, before we go you've now got to explain <laughs> to me how did you go let's put a school playground sound in there we just uh, the school playground was was just a noise we drove past, and I thought, well, it, things that are memory um, triggers, memory triggers, but also white noisy in effect that they're random, you know. So, ah, okay. so a school playground is generally, you know, how um, long a ramp loop is it? How long did you have to? Well, this this is the killer, right? It's been it has an algorithm in there that chops the sounds up into bits and then plays each of the bits like like this so it's building an unlooping each an unlooping loop and what i'd like to do is do a, a vid on it and actually show you what's going on because it is quite interesting the way it works but it's um with a with a school playground you'd be recording lots of different kids in the playground and you'd be recording the background noises and you'd be recording the swings and then you've got an algorithm which is then effectively ah so it's multi-track ah right okay tracking out and that also means you can fit a lot more music in because you're only storing the noises you're not storing the bits in between so, like so we've managed it's like to a get, tracker 
it pretty much yeah so we've managed to get huge amount hours and hours and hours of audio into uh something that doesn't have to be online so i, I mean the, the limit of uh apps that you can download over um cellular is 200 megs and i've got it down to 199 just before we did it so you don't otherwise it says you have to download it over wi-fi so so that so it's, it's pretty clever actually and that and that means you can also turn up the children or turn down the swing noises or all this kind of stuff um so you can it, it's a bit like Instagram filters for audio is the best way I can put it. So if you like the idea of a cat purring in a rainstorm, then you can uh, adjust how much cat and how much rainstorm you want and how bright and how dull it is and how much reverb there is and all this kind of stuff, oh, right. which makes all the difference. <laughs> so, uh, Interesting. Yeah, I will I will show it to you in a, in a three-minute video as soon as it's actually for sale. And, oh, fantastic. Uh, maybe sponsor a, sponsor a Sonic State episode alongside Isotope. Dominic, I, I, that's great. I'm, I can't wait to, to check it out. Um, and thanks again for joining us. And don't forget, uh, no worries. While I should go back again and just sort of mention that the uh, you can win a copy of Neutron 3 Advance. Don't forget, we're looking for the hashtag channel strip as one word, the hashtag Neutron 3 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. on Twitter. Um, and we just want to say, um, yeah, thanks very much to everybody. Thanks for you folks in the chat room and also on the YouTube chat. It's been great to have you aboard. And thanks again to you, Dominic. Uh, that's it for this week. For we'll see you all another time. Take care now. Bye-bye. Au revoir.